welcome to another virtual Fost North event. Big thanks to our sponsors and partners. So welcome back everyone. Uh, now we have the last speaker of the morning session. Um, so welcome Ramon, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Johan. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, in this talk, I would like to uh, talk about uh, domain-driven design uh, in combination with algebraic data types. So a little overview about what we're going to see today is uh, I'm going to go into a bit of, a, of the background why I uh, mentioned this is uh, really relevant or how, how, how does this actually give us uh, some better possibilities that, that other kind of uh, approaches that we use. I'm going to compare with some programming paradigms that uh, most of us that develop uh, mostly have heard about, uh, if not work with. And uh, normally, I don't like to live code, but I would like to do a demo live coding. So uh, bear with me if it doesn't go as expected. Uh, the slides will be provided to Johan uh, and the Force North Conference, and everybody can take uh, copy paste to do whatever they want with them, as it will be distributed onto a copyleft uh, license. Shortly about myself, uh, I'm a mixture of uh, uh, a Spaniard and a Dane uh, marriage. So you can see me there on the right, because with Jitsi, I would rather have a good quality on the slides and the code uh, instead of having this combination with uh, my picture and the slides. So this is me when I do the Movember thing with a stash. I have a degree in computer science and I work uh, on a daily basis with uh, uh, EDU GDPR uh, software in a bit strange way that anybody else is doing. Um, I also have a blog where I mostly put in snippets of code, but I will put here the, 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 the slides for the talk afterwards. But of course, Johan will also distribute it. I'm a believer in open sourceness, so therefore I'm being a, a member of the Free Software Foundation for more like 13 years. And I also very much like uh, functional programming. So I have this meetup group in Copenhagen. And as you can see in the bottom, I've tried uh, a lot of programming languages, and all this are uh, I have used in a professional uh, environment. So just to uh, ensure that everybody that's actually listened to me uh, uh, is actually at the right talk. So uh, what, what I will do, try to do is I will show how we can put in some kind of constraints, and we can check these constraints at compile time. So, so this uh, constraint will actually ensure that the, the implementation will actually comply with a specific domain that we add for a given application. We will be uh, showing code, and of, of course, I will live code at the end, but I don't think you need to know how to code in order to understand what I'm doing, because we're going to use these ADTs, algebraic data types, which uh, reminds very much of English. And, um, I normally always put at the end of uh, the slides that uh, I like uh, to get questions, but sometimes uh, in order to not overlap with other speakers, I try to keep them at the end. So if we can, uh, I can see from the other talk that we're already going to do this. So uh, the reason is uh, why uh, I mentioned this uh, in, in the depth of, of this talk uh, with regard to the, the product type that recently got added to C Sharp in its version 9.0 is that uh, I, where I try to generate this uh, kind of software that will comply with a EU GDPR. But until that catches on, uh, I work uh, and doing some .NET uh, freelance uh, contracts. So most of this freelance contract, it's not allowed to use, for example, the, the functional programming language that come part of .NET, which is F sharp. So you need to uh, stay with C sharp, which is what most people are used to use. So one of the things that lack the most, if you have this uh, functional brain, is that you try to domain uh, or to model your logic into these uh, algebraic data types. So I gave uh, a talk at the beginning of this year uh, uh, based on this uh, tooling that I was creating for uh, a customer. And as we can see in this slide is that sometimes in C Sharp, you will actually get uh, an attribute or a representation of a value where it can be, in this case, a system user, which is represented as a reference type, as an object. And in other cases, when you call this API, you will get it as a primitive value type, uh, like a, a GUIL in the .NET uh, language. So how do you actually 
implement the logic in C sharp in order to uh, comply with both these uh, possibilities in the language. So this will easily be done in, a, for example, F sharp because it has support for these IDTs. So, 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 so this is why I say that it's really, really good that the uh, .NET design team, and this is what I say in the, the abstract, it's really, really good that they added the product type to C sharp. But I'm, what I'm really, really missing still is this some types. And as you can see there in the bottom is, a, I will later on show you how we can mimic uh, the product types with some types. So if the, the .NET design team actually added some types, that would be even better than adding the product types, but hey, uh, it is what it is, right? So in order to uh, hope that you can uh, follow my uh, uh, arguments, I'm going to use a tool, and I can already uh, mention it now. It's uh, F-sharp, and it's because it has support for this uh, three main uh, paradigms that we mostly code in, right? And uh, I might be biased on my opinions, but it's because I'm very into functional programming, but I'm, I will try to be as uh, what's called objective as possible. So uh, just to ensure that we all know what the different uh, definitions are. So we all know that imperative uh, code is more or less what we do when we code in C. Object-oriented uh, programming is more or less what we do when we code in Java, C++, or C Sharp. Functional programming is what we mostly do when we code in OCaml or Haskell and F Sharp, as we will say in a bit. So uh, the reason I choose to show this in F sharp and not in Haskell is that uh, we can actually showcase the three paradigms in F sharp. We will not be able to do that in Haskell because Haskell is a pure functional programming language. So this is why I uh, choose to use um, F sharp and F sharp is uh, very, uh, it's very more, it's very related to C sharp. So, so the definition, which I just copy pasted from Wikipedia, it says it's a functional first, but it's still a general purpose, strongly type. I'm a, believer in types in programming, but it's also multi-paradigm, which is what allows us to do functional imperative and object-oriented uh, programming in this uh, in this tool. Besides this, uh, I think it uh, Sharp has uh, maybe compared to its ancestor, OCaml, some, some really nice features, which I will try to summarize in the next slides. So uh, this uh, concept of force and dentation that you will see also in languages like Python in combination with this pipe operator. It makes it like really easy to read because if you take it from the ancestor OCaml, you can just uh, put in a lot of code and the compiler will actually more or less uh, produce the binaries based on, on the code. But in F-sharp, it, it is a bit more like uh, strict that you need to make the code readable by using indentation like as you do in Python, but also like by using this uh, Pipe operator, we can actually read the code from left to right and then from top to bottom. And this is normally what we do when we read like a, a normal document, right? Uh, if we take like the other paradigm, we, we as we normally read code, right, we go from uh, right to left or left to right, sorry, and then we go from bottom to top. So this is more or less like how we tend to read code, but this is more or less how we do it in F sharp, which I think it's easy um, the understanding for people who don't. Uh, uh, normally code. Also, like in uh, Python, it has uh, the concept of a uh, higher order function. So you can pass in your functions uh, and that way uh, you can reuse a lot of code. Uh, like I say, I'm a, bit, a big believer of uh, type safe code because this helps me whenever I do some mistakes, I'm not going to ship the software to a customer and they get mad. It's actually on my own table. I can fix it before shipping. And then uh, one of the key components, which is really um, ideal to, to use, is when you work with all these components, you're able to make small uh, evaluation of functionality. So you can make small snippets, you can test them, and it's just like uh, working with Legos that <clears throat> you have these small blocks and... Yes, you have these small blocks that you just comp uh, compose to uh, bigger blocks. So let's see some code, and I hope uh, it's visible. Uh, otherwise, um, I will show it in Emacs. So here we will see like how we will do an imperative code, and, and the domain for this is very simple. We have points, and we can have 2D points and 3D points. Uh, points in a 2D plane, we just have an X and a Y, and in a 3D plane, we have X, Y, and Z. 
So in order to uh, instantiate uh, structs and, and imperative languages, uh, we will need to have some kind of a uh, function or uh, yeah, some kind of function. So what, what this function does, it actually instantiates the struct and based on uh, this information, um, we actually set each of the uh, accessible fields or attributes to the value that we specify in this function. The same will happen with a 3D print or the, 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 the 3D point. And I just implemented like some logic where we want to scale it with a factor. So we still need to send in a point, which in this case is a 2D point. And we will take the point and we will make it uh, increase uh, the factors. Then we will just uh, return again the point itself. So as we can see here, it's very much, we need to define a um, 2D point, a 3D point, and then add the functions to instantiate them, and then just like the logic to do this scale. This is why uh, we tend to use uh, object-oriented uh, programming, because we can see that there's some uh, similar similarities between these uh, points, right? So this is why we can make this thing called an abstract class, where we encapsulate all the global, uh, where all the global or common uh, information between the, the two types that we want to work with. And we can even provide some kind of default logic. So we say that um, the whole point of object oriented is that we cannot instantiate an abstract class, but we can provide a, a functionality that, uh, that, that that's um, default for the default case. So as we can see, in order to implement our 2D point, we just need to inherit our abstract class. So now we can instantiate our 2D point and we can just uh, call the underlying point, right? But in order to expand it with a 3D point, we need actually to add uh, the, the C uh, axel, uh, axis. Uh, so we draw more or less to the same. So now we have a new uh, internal uh, variable, which is internal C. And we add the get a set methods that we used to do up here. And then we need to override the default uh, implementation of scale because now we have another uh, axis that we need to uh, take into co consideration when we work with uh, uh, 3D points. So uh, in order to ensure that the scale functionality has the, the same return type, you can see we give it an integer and then it will return us a point. Uh, in object-oriented programming, we need to, uh, this is called downcasting, or oh, sorry, upcasting. The good thing about upcasting is that we can always uh, do it, uh, 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 what can you say, in compile time, and it's safe because uh, going from an inherited uh, class to the abstract class, it's, it's, it's upcasting, and that's always uh, compile uh, safe. So now into this uh, functional programming uh, paradigm. So this is where algebraic data types come in, right? So for us, a point, in this case, we just specified as either a point, the two-dimensional plane, or a point in the three-dimensional plane. I added these two functions uh, because normally when you work with functional programming, you like to work with this concept called curried, where you, uh, instead of providing all the arguments at the same time as we see here in scale, um, Oh, it's small like here. So we can see here that we need to add all the arguments at the same time. What we like to do is we, we just like to add them partially because sometimes you don't have all the, uh, the arguments uh, in that part of the code, but going uh, further into other code branches, you might uh, get the, the second or the third uh, parameter. So that's why you can just send a partially applied uh, function through your code base. But you can see here that we just specified which kind of uh, uh, different uh, subtyping we have for points. And now when we do this scaling function, uh, we are able to actually pattern match on each of those points. So it's very simple and, and concise to, to understand. So, and again, uh, I'm very biased with regard of uh, these comments. So again, I will try to stay as uh, objective as possible. So all programming paradigms, they have the pros and cons, right? So, so what we can get uh, when we use imperative uh, style of code is that uh, these uh, data structs are actually represented as value types and not reference types or pointers to object. So uh, if you have an array, you can actually make your code go really, really fast. 
some cons uh, I um, tend to see when I work with imperative code is that all the values are instantiated by default. So I don't really know if I have set the value to zero or it was instantiated to zero, which can be a bit problematic in some uh, programs. Another thing that is a bit uh, not ideal is uh, because all fields are accessible, everything is public, so you can change it as you want. But since this is a mutable uh, data structure, you can actually uh, mutate it as you please write. But this is not ideal if you work with concurrent software where you have uh, several threads uh, actually trying to update uh, uh, these values. So this is where you need to put in make, uh, lock mechanisms. And that can actually make uh, code go slower if you don't uh, know what you're doing. Also like the lack of polymorphism. So you can see that we have to do more or less the same code all the time. So we have to repeat and more or less, more or less do a lot of copy pasting and does add uh, um, the, the element that's missing, for example, the, the 3D pointer. Uh, one of the good things uh, in F-sharp, uh, when I mentioned this with uh, mutability is that even though um, uh, structs in C are uh, mutable by default. In, in, in Fiat, they actually made them immutable. So you have to specify, as I do here, you have to say, oh, it is actually mutable, which is, uh, yes, here. So you can say it's, it, it is mutable. And point 0.3D, so you have to point at it and make the pointer mutable and then uh, change it afterwards. So this is more or less my in, in impressions of imperative code. Uh, now, if we go to object-oriented, there's like this re re reusability of code by inheritance, as we can see, right? So we specify an abstract class, and for the 2D pointer, we can just inherit the abstract class, and then we're good to go. But of course, we need an extra axis for the 3D, so we're just going to add that. So that's really good. One of the also very good things about OO is that we have encapsulation uh, of internal state. So updates of the X and uh, C and Y, it, it has to go through uh, the get and set methods, right? Which will allow you actually to hide um, uh, data. So let's say that you don't want anybody to change the X uh, value once an instantiated, right? So you can just hide the set uh, statement. So this is something that's uh, really, really good about um, uh, object-oriented uh, programming is that you can hide the internal state. You can also enforce the logic, as you can see here, that we specified that it must have the member called scale that takes a, a number and then returns a point. And you can also um, uh, provide some default um, uh, logic for this uh, method, but you can also allow it to be all written here, as we see in the three-dimensional point. So this is really, really good and object-oriented. The problem is, uh, of course, like I say, everything has good and bad things, is that we have this internal state, which is mutable. So if you export, uh, expose uh, your fields or attributes with a get and set methods, if we work with concurrent software, we have exactly the same problem as we have with uh, imperative programming. Also, like uh, one of the things that uh, it might fear from both imperative and um, uh, function programming language is that or paradigm is that logic is actually bound to the class itself. So in order for this to work, we need to add a member on the class itself, which is called scale. And this is the logic, uh, or yeah, this is the kind of logic that we need to add on, on, on the object itself in order to get it, uh, to, to get modified by, by the behavior. So, so this is like uh, the more logic that you add to some kind of data type, the bigger this object will, will become. Uh, we have some kind of pattern matching, uh, but but it's uh, for up to C sharp and earlier. We have like this kind of limitation that we can only use very uh, specific uh, primitive types. So you have chars, strings, bools, and integers, longs, and so on and so forth, and enums, right? But from C sharp seventh uh, zero, we actually have uh, the possibility to uh, pattern match on non-nullable types. Uh, and the problem with this kind of approach is based on casting and it's not always ideal because you can actually test if something is an int or a char or a string, which is not uh, what we want to do in most cases because uh, that will actually make our unit test cases become huge uh, whenever we have to test, right? So 
As I mentioned before, upcasting, we can always do that statically typed, which is really, really good. But downcasting, this is where it gets problematic. So whenever we downcast incorrectly, we can actually uh, get the error at runtime. And this is what we try to avoid with uh, type safe uh, programming languages, or at least paradigms, yes. So now to the uh, FP code. And again, uh, might be biased, but uh, bear with me. So I, I tend to see this as a, a very and simple, concise way of representing uh, logic into, into code. And this is mostly possible with uh, algebraic data tapes, as, as, as we can see that we can specify uh, whatever we want to do, both when we construct our data elements, but also when we deconstruct them. So, Given this uh, type of, uh, or given this uh, logic or these uh, components, we, we don't need to cast at all. We will never have like an upcast or downcast that actually goes wrong. So ADTs also uh, have built-in constructors, so as we can see here. So I just wrap them to make it more like uh, functionally in this way. But in programming languages like Haskell, we can see that these uh, constructors could be, instead of being a, a all the parameters at the same time, we can actually uh, apply them partially. Uh, the thing that I like the most about this is that we have exhaustive pattern matching. So we can put in some uh, flags on the compiler that will ensure, well, uh, this function doesn't handle point 3D, so I don't really want to build a binary until the person developing this actually adds that clause, because otherwise we know that our code can actually explode at the end. And of course, uh, one of the things that uh, function programming is, uh, has as a, as a key component is this uh, immutability, which makes it ideal to work with concurrent software. And not everything is, is good in FP. So we have exactly the same problem as we have with imperative uh, data struct, is that all fields are actually accessible. So uh, if you want to limit the domain, so you want to use a subset of integers, not all the integers, you're going to have a problem. So let's say you only want to use from 100 to 200. I can at any given point deconstruct the, uh, the, the, the type object, put zero, and then construct it again, because this is what's uh, happening with this uh, piece of code. And again, immutability is good at some point, because it ensures that you cannot uh, update uh, code, uh, or update uh, data elements in memory. Uh, concurrently, but it can also allocate a lot of memory. So, and therefore make your application slow. So you still need to have some kind of a uh, notion of what a functional program uh, works under the hood. So now to the point of ADTs, uh, and I will go a bit more into detail uh, what ADTs actually are and also how we can use it with a uh, domain driven design. So, as I mentioned, product types that was recently added to C Sharp 9.0. If you just have the concept of thinking about it as tuples, and tuple is just like all the kind of different pairs, triples, quadruples, and so on and so forth. So it's just like, you could say like it's like a list of, a, a, a finite list of elements that can be of any types. So here we have uh, 42, and I, uh, I, I you use these two letters in a sharp in order to specify is a byte, because for me, uh, I wouldn't use an integer to specify h, because nobody has minus uh, four h, right? So uh, this is why I, I use um, bytes to represent this, and this might make it a bit like more difficult to read, but here I'm just using a char for the initial for the name would could be Charles. So if we look into what a record type is compared to a product type, so a record type is just exactly the same as a product type, but we just add the labels to make it more understandable. So uh, you could more or less say that this is like a JSON object uh, because we have like a label and then we have like the type, the label, and then we have just like the type. So what are sometimes, this is the thing that I'm really looking forward to, to get into C Sharp. So it's just like this kind of disjoint sets. So these sets don't have elements in common, 
but the, the elements that you actually use it must be in one of these uh, uh, disjoint sets. So mm -hmm. an example could be like a person could either be a child, and after they uh, are eighteen, they actually become adults. Or when we want to measure uh, the temperature, we can use Celsius or Fahrenheit. So when we use uh, when we measure Celsius, we use float because we can have decimals. But when we measure Fahrenheit, we only have uh, integers. So just to uh, go back to the mention I did, uh, I, sh I mentioned before where we could uh, mimic record types with some types. And this is why I think it's more important to get some types into a programming language that maybe go for product types or record types. It's because we can actually mimic the record type here. We can mimic it with a single case uh, some type. So a single case is just if we forget about Fahrenheit of int, we just take the first case here. And this off on the right side, we just uh, provide exactly the same information with uh, labels and the types as we did in the record. So it's uh, an, an equi equivalent way of doing things, but it's, uh, yeah. Normally I will use record types in F-sharp because it has a better uh, interaction with uh, the ecosystem of F-sharp, but some cases, uh, some cases, I actually use uh, some types with single constructors, which we will see later on. So, uh, just a bit uh, more complex scenario where we can uh, see how we can use this uh, pattern matching. So, we have this uh, notion of uh, and just a small domain. I'm just going to use a suite uh, for uh, the different cards. And then just a card is a rank, which can go from one to, uh, I don't know, 10. And then you have like, uh, what's called Jack, King and Queen. And then you have like the suit, right? So in my functionality, I just say, is it an ace? And I will just take a card as an input argument and I will give a Boolean as output or return value. So now a match, I just, can deconstruct the record and say, well, is the rank one? If it's one, I know it's the ace, and then I will say true. And then I have this wildcard notion in F sharp where I can just say, well, all the other cases are actually false. But I can also do it uh, exhaustive. So uh, if I only say, uh, is this card true? And if I don't add this uh, flag in F sharp, I can actually avoid using this uh, other uh, case in the pattern matching. But that will actually make runtime errors. So this is something that we really don't want to do. Another example is uh, if we don't want to do an assert of an age if somebody is uh, actually an ad adult or a child. So we can do this logic where we take the age and then we take like this person and we will return uh, the boolean. So we will say, uh, is this person actually 18 years old? And we can say true or false and so on and so forth. So the good thing about these small snippets is that we just define them more or less in single lines in most cases and sometimes a bit more complex. But once we make these small Lego blocks, we can just combine them. So here we have this product type and an equivalent uh, record type where we have labels. And now we just take a sum type where we combine those two uh, product and record types. So this will actually make like the Cartesian product of all the elements of bytes and chars and this will make all uh, yeah the same Cartesian product because they're those two are equivalent and here we just combine those two uh, what can you say new uh, sets we just combine it into a whole new set so as we will see in the next uh, couple of slides we can see how this is actually ideal because all your domain will just be placed as uh, data or type definitions in your actually code so this is why uh, Jaro Minsky, who is, uh, I think he's the CTO of uh, Jane Street, he come with this uh, sentence in a tweet or was it a blog post where he say, uh, by using this kind of approach, we can actually make uh, illegal states unrepresentable. So if we don't allow them to be possible in the domain or we cannot do them in the code, it's not possible to actually represent them afterwards. And if you cannot represent invalid dates in your code base, you never have to test for it which will actually minimize the amount of uh, use cases or 
unit test cases that we add to our code in order to go into all these corner cases that we sometimes uh, forget about. So this is like a, a common uh, uh, diagram that I use to, 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 to show when I talk about uh, domain-driven design. So you have a lot of business analysts that provides this kind of a uh, documentation with diagrams like this, and in this case, it's an ER di diagram. So, so we can see that the domain of this is, has to do something about planes, booking, hotel, hotels and cars, and so on and so forth. Uh, maybe it's a bit outdated because of uh, the virus right now, so nobody is actually traveling anywhere around. But hey, it's uh, it is what it is. So, so normally what I do is I, I tend to say it's intuitive to see. Well, we, well, we cannot really see that. Uh, well, so so what we can see if we understand uh, ER diagrams, we can see that in order to do a booking, we need to have a plane, right? This is why the one is specified. But we can also see, well, we need to book a plane, but we really don't need to book a hotel because it can be the, either be zero or one, and it's the same with a car, right? So this is something that we can get out of this uh, image or this diagram, right? So mandatory, we need to book a plane when we do a booking, but we, but we could book uh, a hotel or rent a car. This is optional. And this is what happening when we see these diagrams uh, is that this is, um, this is at most what we can get out of uh, this uh, uh, diagram, right? So could we actually uh, devise from this diagram which products are, are being offered? Well, I, I would say that's, that's not possible, right? So this is actually my... Um, my kind of way on how to domain... Uh, design uh, with a uh, code, but it's still not code that implements logic. It's still, it's just code that define uh, a domain. So if we do it like this way, so we can say, okay, we know that the center is like a booking. So we can say, well, we can have a basic booking, which is just booking a plane. We can do a combo, which we will see in a bit. And then we can go with the full pack, which where we actually book everything, right? So we book the plane, the hotel and the car. The plane itself, we need to specify a date uh, when we go to the place and then a return date when we come back, but also like the destination where we want to go, right? The combo, again, this is like we have three different possibilities in the booking. The combo, we can actually go with a hotel and we can also go with a car, right? So when we go with a hotel, it's just like, okay, we'll take the plane and we book the hotel as well. And with the car, we book the plane and the car. So the hotel, we need to provide some kind of arri arrival date, but also a departure date, and of course the location. And the same uh, with the car. Uh, we need to know where we want to book it from and maybe where we want to deliver it to, right? Because we can go to one airport, uh, rent a car there, and then we go to another airport and leave the car there, right? So the city itself is just a string in this case, very basic. and. The date is just like the system date time from, from uh, FSHAP. But now we can see here that it's no logic whatsoever, or implementation logic whatsoever. But we have already defined much more information that we did in the diagram before. So we can see that this software needs to handle three kinds of products, right? Basic, combo, and full pack. And the combo itself is divided into two sub products, which are with hotel and with cars. So we can see those constraints I was talking before with this uh, notion of tuples, uh, pairs and triples. So in order for us to instantiate, uh, or for order for us to, to choose which kind of uh, product or booking we wanna do, we have to go into this uh, union and say, well, is it a full pack or we want the three things? If we provide the three things, it's a full pack, right? And we know that for the basic thing, we need to provide a plane, that's it. That's just a single element, which is pretty simple. But if we go for the combo, we can either provide it with this uh, pair or do those two parameters, which is the plane or the hotel and the plane and the car. And if we don't do this, we cannot instantiate this type of object. And the same goes with the full pack. And we also have uh, we have exactly the same constraints uh, in, in plane, cars and hotels and so, and so forth that we actually need to 
provide these arguments on instantiation. So, so this is why I say that this is a really good way of uh, introducing uh, the design of your software directly into code, but you still have this separation between implementation and design. And the good thing about this design is that this goes into your uh, rep repository where you uh, keep all your code. So you can always see how your domain uh, evolves over time. Uh, you know, the application lifetime management because no software stays uh, as, it, uh, as it was at the beginning. So this will actually allow you to see the, the history. Oh, but we have basic products before in time and now we add them again. And maybe in six months again, we'll remove it again. So, so this is more or less uh, uh, what I want to, to show. And, and now we'll try to do some live coding where I tr will try to uh, implement the domain of a book that can both be used for a bookstore, but also like a library. So I'm just going to take the code here. So if we go to book. Uh, I'm going to start a rebel just to see here over here. Yes. So let's try to read up before uh, what we do. So we know that now in nowadays, nowadays we have more, more or less this three kind of type of books, right? So we have audio books, which we normally call a books. We have electronic books, what we normally call eBooks. And then we have the good old physical books, which we call printed book, books, right? Each of these uh, types of books can actually have several formats, right? So we can have AAC, MP3s, M4Bs, and the old uh, WAV format. And with electronic books, we can have EPUB, we can have MOBI, and also PDF. And uh, the good old uh, printed books, we have hardcore, oh, sorry, hardcover books, which are the ones that I prefer because paperbacks tend to what can you say? When you read a lot of them, it tends to get bent too much, which is not really nice. So what we can devise when we talk about books is that we have some kind of common fields. So this is why I state here that it should be mandatory that we have a title for the book in order to recognize it. Sometimes you can have a lot of authors, you can have one, and sometimes you can have none, which is when it is anonymous written. Normally you will also have like a publisher. So this will give sense. Uh, the language which is written in also helps a lot. And then you have these two kind of uh, identification. Uh, because they are a bit complex, because they, they involve some modulus, uh, I don't know if it's 11 or 13. Uh, when you add in this, um, this logic, I, I'm just going to specify them, but I'm not going to implement it here because it can take some time. Uh, one of the things that would be optional is that that would be pages because electronic books and printed books, they both have pages, right? That's what books are. But uh, audio books, they don't have pages because we listen to them from uh, our either laptops or tablets or uh, phones, right? Smartphones. And here I would like to showcase how you can do like uh, we want a rating to see if they're good. So we want to give them one to five stars. And here I would like to showcase you how you can limit a uh, given primitive type. So in this case, we will use a byte. But how do I ensure in my whole domain that I know for a certainty that a book will always have either a value from one to five and it will never have another value. So this is something that we can do in algebraic data type if we combine it with some fancy stuff that I will show you in a bit. So I can see here that the first thing I did was put in the review and it was a rating, so let's do a type rating. And that will just be... So the trick is uh, in Haskell, uh, by default, uh, your uh, logic in your modules here is actually uh, uh, hidden. It's not exposed, but both in OCaml and in Fiat, this logic is actually exposed by default. So what you need to do is you need to say, well, my constructor needs to be uh, hidden. So now we can do let uh, as it rate of x, and we can say if x is 
greater or equal to zero, and if x is less or equal to five, then we will get some x. Otherwise, we will not get a valid rate, right? And just to see if this works, we can actually look into the snippet here and do So we can do our review and we can say, I want to do a rate of 42. Now the code itself tells us, well, the constructor is not available. So you need to use other kind of logic in order to do this. And because I implemented a rate function, now we could say, well, the value you have given me is not actually available. So what if I give it a valid one? Oh, now I actually have, oh, and this is actually wrong because it needs to be a rate of x. Yes. Because otherwise, if I expose the, uh, I understand that. See how type, uh, type systems help you to code better? Yes, and now we do it. So 42. We provide with a byte and here we just say well so now we actually have a valid rate value and now we need to provide this uh, rate information into our domain so we ensure that our books only have a valid rates right so let's look into the formats and we can see the formats we can have both types for audio and we will go with a a a c B3, B4B, then we have electronic, and we have input, mobile, PDF, and then we will have print, of course, hard cover, paper. So now we use uh, three sum types to specify the different formats that are actually uh, available for each of uh, each of uh, the different types, right? So now, as before, we saw with uh, the booking type, we're going to have three kind of uh, uh, three kind of book types. So we're going to say, well, we're going to have an audio of audio. Then we're going to have a electronic of electronic and we're going to have a print of print. Uh, this is, I add some spaces just to make it a bit more um, readable. If I just run this code as it is, it will actually complain because there's nothing called audio yet, right? So what you can do with, um, sharp in this case is that you can add in an add clause where you say well we will have an audiobook or yes an audio type of book that will equals and we can say of course we will need all this mandatory uh, information because this is what we have in common but we don't need these pages and we will also have the rating right so what we need to do is we're going to say we will need uh, common values and then we will need, well, only the rating, which is of the type uh, review and then it's rating. Notice that I add it uh, as the type itself. I don't add it as an option type. It's because I only want to have valid ratings on the books. So. What I need to do is I need to ensure that I get a valid rating with this functionality. And based on this sum non case, I can, uh, if I have the valid data, I can actually pass it to the next uh, logic in code and I can actually generate or instantiate an audio book or a type of book that has exactly uh, a, a, a valid rating. So then we also have And we will have an electronic, 
and that will be we will also need a common common is just all these mandatory fields and here we will actually have some pages and I think we can get away with an unsigned integer 65 and just to see that system and look at this I have never written a book that has more than 65,000 pages, so I think that will do. And of course, we will need a rating as well. I don't know why I keep forgetting to put electronic C at the end. That's kind of strange. And then the last book we need is just good old print books. And we can more or less copy paste this. So what I'm seeing here, there's actually a missing part. So I would really like to add formats and format would be audio here and format would be format electronic. And here the format would be format print. Yes, so this is more like the domain I will like to use. So if we run this now, it's going to give an error because we don't have common specified yet. So now we can just do and common just equal all the title will be some kind of string authors, which will be would be some kind of list, list of strings, and what else? A publisher, which also would be a string. And then we have the language, which would be a type language. And the ESPN 10. Thirteen and so on and so forth, and we will need to do n language will be of type. Well, it's Sweden, so we have uh, English, and we have Swedish because of fourth north, and we have es en ten, which is of type ESBN ten. String does not. Yes, so now we actually have specified the domain for our um, book. And nobody says this is the right way to do it. This is just how I see uh, it gives sense for me. But the good thing is that we have specified uh, a lot of uh, constraints into the domain. So for example, we never need to test if an audiobook has uh, uh, pages, right? This is not part of the record type, which is part of the overall uh, sum type. So this is something that we never need to, to, to test with, right? And if we put into this object or oriented um, paradigm where we sometimes make this an abstract class, of course, uh, we can solve this with uh, uh, an interface where we just say that uh, both uh, electronic and print need to implement the the, the, the pages interface. But but it, it can get sometimes uh, cumbersome uh, to, to, to do all this logic. And, and it gives sense in the object-oriented way. But the problem, as I see it when I work with this, is once you have a list with all these elements in there, when you begin to upcast and, and downcast and you don't have uh, all the logic, right? Because uh, if we implement the interface on electronic and print, they will have an extra method that when you call it, it will say pages. But the problem is you don't have that method on audio. So you need to uh, distinguish in some way. And well, uh, this uh, iterated uh, element uh, has uh, of the type audio, 
and these other ones have of the type uh, electronic and print and those uh, two types have an extra method that you can call so so at least with the the, the pattern matching here in the sharp you can ensure that uh, as we saw in the first slide if we just go back here that when we, pro we provide logic which is not bound to the data type itself we can always deconstruct the different kind of uh, types that are built uh, that are bound to this uh, overall type um, yeah so so just a note uh, where, what i showed big at the beginning this uh, rate thing uh, so this is the way that we do in a functional program. This is the way we encapsulate data uh, by uh, limiting exposure of private constructors. So, so this way we can actually more or less achieve, and I will not say the, the case where we can actually somehow bypass it, but there's still ways to, to, to reduce that bypassing. But this is more or less the, the way we would try to mimic the object-oriented uh, encapsulation uh, approach. So I really hope, um, that I more or less show you a new way of thinking on how uh, you can actually make a more reliable sound uh, uh, application by modeling uh, the business logic itself into the application by using these uh, algebraic data types to design the system. And afterwards, we will use uh, all the parts of the code to, to actually implement it. And I really, really hope that this gets out to the C sharp design team so they finally add this uh, component to to the language which is good at uh, as it is but i still need uh, i still miss that little thing for me but and again i go back to this thing that because we use these adts we can actually uh, use these mathematical constraints of uh, of sets and uh, to 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 limit um the the, the, the logic uh, that we can have in uh, in, in our uh, applications and yes and as i mentioned also like if you can't uh, represent the validator you never have to think about test and test uh, for it and i think that was what i wanted to say so if there are any questions yes thank you there, there are questions um we got one question here from uh, gina how do you get an organization to invest in functional programming Aren't all non-academics and especially managers very scared of it, independent of the benefits? Uh, it is a bit uh, problematic because uh, you can do some really, really cool stuff with this approach. But if it's only a small subset of people in your organization doing this, when th those people leave, because let's face it, uh, IT people uh, swap around all the time. So if you don't have a, a global understanding of this approach, it's not going to be viable to 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 maintain this piece of code. So this is why uh, I like the approach of C sharp that they're beginning to take a lot of chunks of F sharp and they're beginning to port it into the language. And this way, C sharp people will work as they do. And every time there's come one of these features, C sharp people get really really excited because wow, this is really cool. But this is what we F sharpers or Camels Haskell has been doing all the time. So I don't mind if they steal with pride from F sharp and put it directly into C sharp because when I work on this freelance contracts, I can actually work the way my brain gives sense. And people, once they see it in the C sharp context, they will just say, wow, this is amazing. This is what happened with the link, right? Everybody thinks link is the, the, the best thing that ever happened to C sharp, right? But the whole paradigm of link is built on functional programming and the way that you actually hand, uh, um, work with data in functional programming. So. I, I'm I'm not even mad as the meme says, right? So please bring all this fancy things from uh, the functional programming uh, paradigm into uh, languages like uh, C sharp, and we already have them in Rust, and we already have them in Swift. So it's just like keep them coming. Yeah, and uh, the next question actually sort of ties into that. It's from Johan. How, yes. does the, how does the F-sharp interface look to the C-sharp world? Is, it, is this a good way to build types for an object-oriented system by using functional programming methods? Uh, so so uh, the, the thing about F-sharp is uh, because it's uh, built into the .NET ecosystem, it, it can actually coexist very well. Like it, it can access 
almost seamlessly, uh, seamlessly uh, logic on, for example, uh, C sharp libraries. But when you do that, you still need to understand that there can be null pointers, there can be all this kind of uh, behavior that you have in C sharp. Uh, when you call it um, in a, what can you say, in a, uh, in a trivial way, you might uh, pour all that kind of uh, misbehavior into F sharp. So this is why you need to make some kind of constraints when you interact with those libraries. And, and the way you can do it from F sharp to C sharp is try to do a lot of uh, try catching. And then the other way around is expose your uh, F sharp libraries uh, with a C sharp wrapper. So it's more seamlessly, seamlessly to work with from uh, C sharp. Oh, so so if, if you don't do these wrappers, it becomes uh, just like any other foreign function interface, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thing. So so yeah. Uh, it's uh, you have to do a lot of defensive programming because it's um, it's it's a bit um, yeah problematic, especially if you see it from the F sharp uh, perspective. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, then I had a question, which is uh, sort of uh, I mean now we're talking about uh, algebraic data types and how to how to protect uh, against. Uh, Bad state. Why? Why not take it uh, all the way and just uh, use dependently typed programming instead, where you would. Yeah, but dependently typed programming. Type. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I think there's uh, still uh, isn't like still a big gap from academia to industry. As I see it now, uh, we still uh, have a bit of problem problem to get the functional programming language into industry. And just imagine if you have to put independent types, right? <laughs> yeah, it's similar to the the question from Gina before. That uh, you need sort of a, yeah, yeah. a critical mass. I, I would still so, say that in order to get dependent typing, you might have to read out to people working with Cog, Acta, or Idris. But in order to get people, uh, and and I, I I guess that requires more or less an academic uh, degree. But I still think that uh, functional programming languages, uh, I have this group in Copenhagen, and we have people working with Clojure that never uh, went to a university. So there's a lot of flavors in functional programming. So there's a lot of people coming in from all, all, all around. So so I think it's maybe easier to get FP in, uh, FP in to a palette of te uh, technologies than maybe dependent types. Yep, yep, sure. All right, I think that's yeah that's all the questions we had we had no new ones on the live chat uh, thanks a lot Ramon yeah thank you and uh, Johan do you want to say something before we head off to lunch no I want to say that we're heading off for lunch so the stream will resume at 2 uh, it will stay open so so feel free to uh, to join us back at uh, 2 o'clock and until then big thanks for everyone showing up speakers viewers, and then the rest of you. Cheers. <laughs>